So welcome everyone uh, to this uh, extraordinary session of our clinical sessions that we develop here, that we do at the uh, Observatory of Patient Experience at the Hospital Clinic uh, of uh, Barcelona. Uh, today we have this session in, in English because we have the honor uh, to have with us um, uh, Mark Loper, he's an MD internist, uh, pulmonologist by training, but currently he's the CEO of the University Hospital UZ Brussels in Belgium, and he will make uh, this talk, uh, this online session about um, how is his role as a distinguished expert in healthcare management who has been working with uh, data-driven healthcare uh, to provide uh, an overview of how he developed the EPRAM systems and, and how this uh, strategy of innovative data collection can be uh, uh, processed uh, to have um, an influence in, uh, in decision making, not only at uh, practice level, but also at management level. This uh, this talk, it's uh, titled Unlocking Insights, uh, Leveraging EPRIMS and Professional Experience Data for Healthcare Management. And we'll have a duration uh, approximately about 25 to 30 minutes. And then we have, uh, yeah, sorry. OK, and then we have uh, a Q&A uh, round for about 10 minutes, more or less. So I think that. Uh, Without uh, further ado, we might start with with the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nopen. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, first of all, for having me, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, to give this lecture to the Barcelona audience, which I some of you met a few months ago uh, with the SPX uh, award ceremony. So um, I was asked to give some insights on how we use data in our everyday management uh, of the hospital and um, more in particular what we do with uh, patient feedback and how we got to this actually. So to give a, a management summary of my talk, uh, I, will, I will have three chapters if you want. Uh, the first one is on the, the journey that we have uh, taken over the past years uh, in terms of hospital strategy um, and that is the, the the eternal question on the pathway from mission statement to strategy to strategy to strategic plan to tactics to operations and uh, i will show you how we got to the fact that uh, patient experience and the patient journey uh, became paramount uh, in this wow. and a second sub part of this is OK. Um, making a plan is not so difficult, but how do you translate it into action and follow up correction of the plan? That's the first uh, part. The second part is the, um, the uh, acknowledgement of the fact that uh, actually uh, you have to think about it. Nobody actually wants to be in a hospital, except we, of course, who work there and we like it but I'm talking about patients, of course. Um, so uh, it's, it's very important to have a good picture on what do patients actually want when they come to the hospital. And uh, a, a second sub part of this chapter is that if you want to deliver um, an optimal patient experience, the key prerequisite for that is to have happy personnel and happy collaborators. Otherwise, they cannot provide the patient's experience that you want. That's an insight that has grown the last couple of years. And the third part is about data, actually. And um, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, evidence-based medicine and also evidence-based management. And what is important in this is to uh, acknowledge the fact that the hospital, between brackets, actually does not exist. You have departments and services who can be very different with very different patients and very different um, uh, expectations. So there is no single golden rule and uh, you need uh, kind of uh, a la carte uh, solutions for, um, for this, but I will come to that. Uh, first of all, it is interesting to know if you talk about management and I'm a doctor and 
also now a CEO. And it's also good, uh, always good to, to, to think about how these two sides of the hospital between brackets, how they think of each other. And for instance, CEOs, they officially, they, they talk about quality of care and community issues, physician partnership, and also a little bit about the patient. It comes on point number four. Whereas physicians say that CEOs, uh, uh, physicians, sorry, say that they also think primarily of quality of care, uh, local community issues, et cetera, et cetera, and some patient advocacy also. On the other side, physicians say that we CEOs, we think about money and costs and markets and ambitions and the word uh, patient is not there except in the secondary role and vice versa. CEOs say that doctors think about mainly care about money and uh, share of profits, etc., etc., equity, power, etc. So it's good to know if you have to run a hospital, it's good to be a doctor at the same time uh, because you know uh, the two sides. But this is just a general introduction. And it's always good to know um, uh, whom is your, in, your, in your audience. Now, I said it all starts with strategy and mission statement. And a strategy, uh, I, I, like I told you, making a plan with an intended strategy is not so very difficult, but you have to realize that the, the time uh, lag of a, of a strategic plan used to be about 10 years the time horizon, but now has been reduced to five years or less. Anyway, it's a plan that is in the longer term, uh, a longer term uh, plan for the hospital. It's not the yearly operational plan, but you have to realize that there is a lot of emergence coming in, things that change, for instance, a virus that comes along, the coronavirus that can change your strategy uh, in, in 24 hours. But there are many other things that happen uh, in terms of regulation, in terms of new developments, etc. So you have to be very aware of the fact that making a strategic plan is actually a continuous um, effort. And a strategic plan, actually, it gives the, the only a few things about your hospital in this matter. Uh, the strategic plan should provide a direction where everybody in the hospital has to go and should define the boundaries and, and saying this is what we won't do. We won't swim outside of this corridor. We will do this and we will not do that. And it goes in that direction. That's the role of the board and the management of the hospital to define where you want to go with the community, which actually is a, a hospital. And every hospital has to do it. So you might say um, every hospital will be doing the same. And actually, as an as an exercise, and we, do, we have done this in Belgium, and you might do this in, in Catalonia or in Spain, is to have a look at the websites of all the hospitals, and you skip out the name of the hospital, and you give them the anonymous website to a jury. And you ask them to uh, define the hospital which has made this website. And if you do that, we have done this exercise with about 30 hospital websites in Belgium. You cannot see any difference. It's all the same. The patient is central, blah, blah, blah. So it's a good exercise to check your own st strategy. And, and do you, do you um, uh, define the differences, the different activities that you do as compared to your colleagues or comp competition, if you want? You, you can do the same things the same treatments, the same uh, medical activity, but maybe in a somewhat unique way. And then I come to patient experience in a moment, and that can be one of your USPs uh, in the hospital. Anyway, you have to make choices. Strategy is foremost to define and to decide what you will not do. Because uh, now for the moment, we are in our budget talks within the hospital. We see our 42 medical departments, and they have a wish list like they still believe in in uh, in, 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 the, in the Christmas guy yeah, in, in uh, St. Nicholas. So we have to decide what we will do and we will not do. And as I said before, the strategic horizon used to be about a decade. 
but since the world is changing so quickly, uh, it is it has been reduced to about four to five years, and you will see our plans, which have to be updated every four years or so. So it's about the why you are doing what you're doing, how you will do it, and what you will actually do. It starts with the mission statement. Every hospital has this. I'm sorry the slide is in Dutch because I took it from our website. It's the mission and the vision and the values that you want your hospital to um, embody. And then again, uh, again in Dutch, I'm sorry, but I will explain um, our first uh, one of our first strategic plans, which was written 10 years ago. You see five pillars and the first one is called um, a satisfied patient in an efficient hospital. And one of the bullets would be listen to the patient and I will show you how we have done that. And the second, uh, the fourth pillar there is about our people, our collaborators talent and passion in movement, uh, because I'm happy to say that already 10 years ago, we saw that the human factor in the hospital is actually the crucial factor. We adapted it in 2017, again in Dutch, my apologies for this, but you see there the two dark green uh, first um, uh, quadrants, uh, patient experience. It's the first time that this word comes up, and the second is our own professionals, our own people to uh, make them happy so that they can deliver this patient experience that we want. By the way, our strategic plans are always made in, with an extensive process of uh, world cafes, uh, um, uh, sessions uh, where all the all the department heads and all the collaborators are welcome. It's hundreds of people who co-write this strategic plan, and we, as a management, we make as a management summary of this, and this is then approved by the board uh, of the hospital. So this is not an idea that we had as management or as the CEO. This is things that pop up from the floor as one of the strategic USPs of our hospital. The final map is completely eligible. It was two years ago um, at the, the end of the first COVID year where we adapted again our uh, strategy map and we used the context of a balanced scorecard. And in this, uh, we tried always to summarize it in one slide. Um, so it is a little bit too, too loaded here. But here again, patient experience and collaborator satisfaction are main issues. And we used the, the, um, the format of a balanced scorecard in this because we want to professionalize, professionalize and also incorporate the use of data in our decision making and follow up. So uh, you, you may know the concept of a balanced scorecard. It is a, um, a strategic management, management performance metric. So you have to define the things that you will uh, measure, that you will communicate to your departments and services and that you can use in order to improve um, the working uh, of, of the, the hospital. So it gives you a, a summary view uh, in real time. So we used to have this every six months or so, and now we have it in real time. So every one of us can go to the, the ClickSense and, and check out the, the latest uh, evolutions in, in the parameters that we have defined up front. So how do we came from a strategy to a balanced scorecard? In the management team, we decide first and for all the ownership of each team. So everyone uh, of our team has um, is owner of one or several of the of the, the 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 topics that will be measured. We define the metric and the indicator for each team. We define the ambition level. Uh, do we want to be good, uh, excellent, outstanding? Um, and then, in order, in in the term, in in the in the context of following up these parameters, we try to define initiatives to reach that ambition or to improve the results, uh, or to reconsider if we don't reach our budget. And this is the basic the basis on which we define our um, budget cycle uh, in the yearly budget cycle where we um, uh, define the budgets for which projects. It has to be within the framework of the strategic plan and the operational plan uh, of the hospital. Every department of this hospital has access 
to his part or her part of, of this complete scheme. We as a management team, we have the overview, but every department has this and ha has been invited to define the metrics which are relevant for this or that uh, department. It can it can differ, of course. Eh? A neurosurgical department is something else than a maternity department, right? So they have different uh, metrics. And we, as the management team, we report uh, to the board of directors of the hospital. That is the way um, we uh, we have come from, uh, let's say, um, an idea popping up from the floor and then translate it into the strategic plan uh, of the hospital. Our idea was that if you don't do that, if you don't bring it up to the highest level, that is the board of the hospital, then you risk that it won't happen. That is just one of the things that the management, <coughs> sorry, the management has decided upon. No, we think it is of strategic importance for the hospital. And the concept of patient experience therein is paramount. OK, second part, nobody wants to be in the hospital. Um, how do we know? So first of all, um, we have a hospital that has 24 medical departments, um, which is uh, way too much, but this is the way it is. Uh, and so the patient does not exist. Uh, the patient that goes to the maternity or the fertility clinic or the psychogeriatrics or the orthopedics, it's different patients. You have overlaps, but in general, it's different publics. So the hospital actually, and that is very important, I'll come back to that, also does not exist. Because the, the difference in business between, uh, let's say, um, a, a cold orthopedic surgery department for hips and knees, the business processes are completely different if you compare to, for instance, an intensive care unit. Also, nobody comes for fun to the hospital. You have to be very good aware of that, and that's the logic itself. But you will see that what we asked the patients, what was important for them, and we learned a lot about this. What is important also to know is that we thought that the patients would consider the quality of the medical treatment and the medical expertise and the know-how to be paramount in their wish list. It is not, except for the relatively rare, very complex cases where people look for surgeons, for instance, with the best track record, that is something else. But in general, the patients who come to a hospital, they think that medical expertise and quality is normal because people who work in hospitals are professionals. They know their business. So that is not the first thing that comes into their mind when they say, what do you really think is important when you go to the hospital. What was important, and by far the number one, is the way you are treated as a human being when you come to the hospital. It has to do with empathy, with compassion, with respect, with friendliness, with politeness, with personalized approach, etc. This is the number one on the wish list of uh, our patients. And I think that you can only, and we have proof for this because we measure it, you can, what you need is the basic requirement is that you, you need happy personnel because people who work in hospitals, they do this out of their heart. It's kind of yeah, caring for people. It's, it's, that's why you work in a hospital, but you have to have the possibility to do that and enough time, uh, for instance, to do that. Uh, how do we know all this? We just did a market analysis between brackets. We interviewed 4,000 patients. And we asked them, and it's a very time consuming uh, um, exercise, but we have learned enormously about this on what do they actually want. And so what I told you in the previous slide is actually um, if you if you summarize uh, what they want is patient experience uh, is an uh, agreeable patient experience. It is this that they want. That is the human touch. Somebody who uh, who uh, is really and authentically uh, involved with the patient uh, treatment. And that is more than medical know-how and medical expertise and um, stuff like that. I also said that the hospital does not exist. And that is important to, con to, to remember. And this is a, a fantastic study. It's all, all already 13 years old by a Finnish engineering um, a group who, who studied the, the business going on in a hospital 
and they compared it with uh, let's say the industry businesses that are uh, out there and if you and they call it the operating modes in healthcare and as you can see there are seven red um, activities in a hospital which are actually very much different from each other and we ask and we and and so the concept of the general hospital with 41 uh, specialties where at least seven businesses are run with in the same in the same building with the same people with the same budgets with the same syndicates with the same rules and regulations actually it's crazy it's crazy how we do it and if you compare for instance here you see the seven business modes and if you look at the industry models you can see that they are completely different to give you one example the elective surgery, for instance, uh, the, the hip surgery, the knee surgery, the cataract surgery, things like that, who are relatively predictable and standardizable. There, the, the business model could be automotive, uh, the Toyota manufacturing system, Lean, Six Sigma, etc. Uh, but you cannot apply this, for instance, in complex activities like we see in a university hospital, where you have very complex and poorly predictable uh, pathologies in the same patient, for instance, and there you they compare it with complicated, uh, difficult projects like building a rocket or building a ship or things like that, which is not automotive, which is like um, like a belt where, where uh, 2000 similar output products are made every day. And to give you one example, when 10 years ago, uh, everybody said you, know, you have to be lean and black belt Six Sigma, etc. in the hospital, and I, I there was something wrong in my mind, and so I took my management committee to a Volvo cars factory here in Ghent, uh, close to Brussels. Automotive is the typical example of this um, of this business mode, and we entered the the factory where they made cars, and I knew after three seconds that it would be stupid to introduce this in every department in a hospital. So I. I could not agree with the concept of you have to be lean and a black belt Six Sigma all over the place in your hospital. So those who tried it, they failed. You can apply some of the principles, for instance, in this elective business, but not, for instance, in the care business or in the complex business or in an emergency department, for instance. So that is important if you consider patient experience to be one of your major USPs, you have to consider that the patient does not exist and the hospital with the department does not exist either so it has to be tailor-made and i will give you at the end of my talk some examples of these tailor-made um, metrics that you can use in terms in function of where you are in the hospital so nobody comes to the hospital for fun so our job is to make everything that is let's say business wise as flawless as possible so the processes have to be between brackets perfect from appointment making to invoicing the patient. It has to be almost flawless without difficulties. You can be proactive in that. For instance, we send, uh, we have an app where the patient can find his way in the hospital and instead of all colors and, and arrows, etc. Uh, so the routing, sorry, there's a, an, an edit there. Um, the tr uh, we give a, a message for the expected travel time. So if the patient has an appointment at 10 o'clock and we see the traffic in, uh, around the hospital, we say you have to leave now, probably if you want to be in time, etc. Find the, pack, the parking, the entrance, etc. And then very important, the first contact. How the f because you have only one one first contact. Huh? So that is extremely important and um, boring things like um, waiting times in waiting rooms, et cetera. And I'll show you some examples. We can add some value there so that for the patient, there is some kind of low unexpected um, experience. So what we do as a hospital, as a management is to work on the processes and eh? what is the normal, what should be below the waterline. The patient should not know anything about that, but that we have to think about our processes so that we, that we have enough space and time and resources to add value, to give this compassion, empathy and wow. And we can measure the effect, and I'll come, that is the third part of my talk, 
we can measure the effect of all these uh, efforts. And I, give, I will show you some simple examples. Hospitals are in general, especially old hospitals, like ours is already 45 years old, so it's actually an old building. So we are renewing the hospital. We don't have the, the space to build a new one, but we try to create another environment, what we call a healing environment, make it that our people are happy in the first place so that they can translate it to happy patients. And for the patients, we make things like uh, Zen gardens and, and we use art, a lot of art uh, in the hospital. There is evidence that this has a positive effect on patient experience and patient outcome length of stay, uh, et cetera. Uh, I steal a lot. For instance, um, 10 uh, years ago, we opened uh, some uh, clinics in the Middle East and one in Kuwait and one in uh, Abu Dhabi. And so I did a lot of prospecting and I visited many hospitals in the Middle East, at least in the rich part of the Middle East. And you see incredible uh, uh, buildings, uh, uh, Club Med, uh, like uh, very uh, nice resorts usually not my style and that is not the reason why I show it but there were two things that I stole or that I tried to steal from there one was not possible it was the fact that in every hospital in the Middle East and the entrance you have a lot of flowing water because that in those countries is a sign of health and wealth and richness that you have uh, running water now in Belgium that is not allowed by the law eh, because of legionella and, and moisture etc the second thing, so I couldn't use that. The second thing I used, um, if you enter a hospital in the Middle East, there is an incredible perfume, eh? perfume, an incredible scent, smell, way too too strong for my taste, but it had an, an incredible impact on the local population. And then I remembered my um, physiology courses that a scent is the oldest scent and is directly linked to emotions. So when now we have uh, perfume machines, scent machines at every entrance of the hospital where we uh, experiment with different flavors and different uh, scents, different perfumes. And we ask the patient if they notice anything. So it's not very strong. You don't get overwhelmed by, by the smell, but there is something in the air. And that, you know, these things that, that cost nothing and it can really change the experience of the patient. Hotels is another um, source of um, ideas. Every year I go to New York to visit our American alumni students, and I usually take the Marriott uh, the, close to New York, uh, to the Times Square. And uh, one day it was overbooked and they sent me to this hotel. This is Citizen M, it's another hotel. And I entered this hotel and I saw this, and I was expecting the typical reception of a hotel a desk with people in costumes. They ask you all the things that you already filled in in your papers when you booked. And here I found people in the bar and playing music, etc. And there was no desk. And there was one guy in a T-shirt who saw that I was a little bit uh, puzzled. And he said, this is the first time. Yes, you have to go to these screens here. And I went to the screens and they pop up and they just asked two questions. They, Did you make a reservation? Yes or no? Yes. And then they said, uh, put your visa card in here and the key came out. You have room 308. Have a nice day. Thank you. It took five seconds. And I thought this is my next polyclinic. It's my next clinic. It's not for every patient because the patient does not exist. But for quite uh, some clinical activities in my hospital, this would be perfect. To, um, and, and I asked uh, this guy in, t in the T-shirt, it's a fantastic idea. And he said, yeah, we did market research, like we did with our patients, you remember? And he said, 95% uh, of the guests in our hotel, they just arrived from JFK, from the airport, and they just arrive here and they want one thing, that is a room, a shower, and then go out to Times Square. So that's, so they thought about the process and I said, we, we, everything we want to know about our guest, we already know because he made a reservation and we asked everything. So we don't ask it two times. So this is how we figure now the way our parts of our new polyclinic work. The patients do all the work between brackets and we already know what they have, what they want, et cetera, et cetera. And so they just have to come in, put their ID in and everything else follows automatically. So it's thinking and then in a nice environment, of course, 
which doesn't remember. This doesn't make me think about a hotel in the first place. It's like a lounge or a bar or a nice place to be, but not this typical hotel. We are building a new entrance of our um, uh, hospital. And there, you know, you have to make a new floors and you typically we were thinking about offices for doctors. And in my generation, when you made a career in the hospital, you got always a bigger office. Eh? Uh, but the generation who comes in now in the hospital, they don't want offices. They want to work together. They are digital savvy. They can work anywhere. And so we 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 save a lot of money and space not designing uh, the typical offices for doctors, which are actually empty for 90 percent of the time. Uh, but we use this kind of space elements now. Food uh, exactly the same. Uh, 20 years ago, the food in the hospital was terrible for the patients and also for um, the personnel. But if you want to have happy personnel, then you have to adapt to the current um, the current habits of having a, a variety of possible catering uh, possibilities. Also, because we are very international hospital. So uh, this matters. This makes a difference for patients. Waiting rooms are terrible places. Um, and so uh, a friend of mine is the, the director of a conservatory in Brussels and his last year students of music, they have to perform in public. And he was asking me, do you know any places where they can play? I said, yes, my waiting rooms. So they do pop up concerts, mini concerts in the waiting rooms without that the patients know about it. And they play and they go away and the patients, they just love it. That is the wow effect. It doesn't cost any money. And it makes all the difference. Those patients will be your best ambassadors um, in all the measurements that you take on their satisfaction. Finally, also, uh, for instance, uh, pets are not allowed in the hospital in Belgium. So we built next to the hospital a villa. It is called Villa Samson. Samson is a famous play dog in Belgium where uh, kids can uh, meet their, uh, their own pets or their therapy pets. Uh, in the palliative context, people can say goodbye from their pets. And we have therapy dogs and therapy cats that we use for some psychiatric um, conditions uh, like um, uh, autism spectrum, uh, like uh, fooding, uh, like uh, bulimia, anorexia and stuff like that, where therapy animals are the best possible treatment. They are much better than our psychiatrists, I dare say. Um, but it's it's something that is original, that is a USP, and that will really uh, make the difference for your uh, patients and also for your personnel, because we have also personnel who comes there to take a break, to take five minutes off, to play with the therapy animals, uh, to do a little Zen, um, Zen session. So we have psych psychologists there, we have physiotherapists, and this is all funded by charity money. So it's not public money. It's not money of the hospital. But um, there's a lot of service clubs, etc., who, who will sponsor this. So again, I would, these are some ideas that I want to share with you on how you can make a big difference with very little um, effort. Uh, I think, oh no. So, um, sorry. Yeah, this is the next one. Um, as I said, if you want to give a good patient experience, you need happy personnel. And that is all about how you treat your people and you treat your personnel. So if you show respect and if you make them, uh, you appreciate them. Uh, and this is nothing to do with money, but a lot with uh, how you how you treat your, your, your colleagues. They will make uh, the difference. And for instance, during the COVID um, periods in our hospital, uh, we have more than 105 actions taken. And I will not go into detail, it will take too long. But they were all focused on how can we thank our personnel for the efforts that they did, the uh, unimaginable efforts. How can we appreciate them, et cetera, et cetera. And this translates into KPIs, into data, because we have a very low uh, turnover of personnel. We have a very low sick leave and we have a very high satisfaction rate. We measure that. So this proves our point that, well, it's common sense actually, but um, it's a good thing that you can have hard data uh, showing this. And some, some, yeah, I'm not going into details, 
we gave, uh, for instance, once a week, we gave a free uh, petit déjeuner for all the personnel, and we, we made a, a, a feast about it. This is in, in the middle of COVID, right? Uh, for instance, for all people who did late shifts and overnight shifts, um, once a week, and this is typically for Belgium, we, we made uh, French fries, Belgian fries. Eh? And then the CEO helps the people in delivering the fries to all the personnel. And the other day, it was my general manager, then it was my finance officer, then it was my HR officer. But the C-suite was on the floor. And then you make your uh, personnel happy between brackets, and so they can deliver the excellent patient uh, experience. We provided free podiums because the artists in Brussels, the theatres were closed, and so we asked them to perform, not now for the patients, but for our own personnel. And these were wonderful moments so that we could show our, uh, our um, uh, gratitude and respect for our collaborators. And the thing is, it was a team effort. Everybody in the hospital was involved, all our 4,200 people. And that's why uh, I like this idea of there is no I in the word team. And the program, this is in Dutch, I'm sorry, but the program was called hashtag care for me. And that was a, a combination of actions um, throughout the hospital uh, throughout the complete COVID period, and we have continued now uh, because COVID, uh, luckily for the moment, it's about over in terms of, of severity. Um, but we keep these efforts uh, going. Um, I can skip that. Okay, third part because I'm running a bit late. Um, KPIs and measurements. Um, so, what is important to know and uh, to consider? is that patient experience is, a, is a, 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 a complex thing and it's actually, it's, it's a summary of things. It's not just one thing, but it can be, um, it, it can be uh, changed or in a positive or negative way by a variety of things. That is from something you have to consider if you start measuring things. As I told you, this typical patient does not exist. You have several types of patients in several departments, but you have to know that. So you can adapt your measurements in terms of the pathology and the servants. And there are a variety of methods. So what we do is we combine, we, we try to, to pick the, the best of all worlds and to make a comprehensive idea, a comprehensive dashboard of um, our um, patient satisfaction in terms of hospital in general, hospital-wide, but also department or pathology specific. And I will show you some examples of this. So the methods we use is a, a digital platform, which is called Hello Customer. And every patient, every patient that enters and leaves the hospital, outpatient, hospitalized patients, they receive uh, an email with an NPS um, questionnaire, which is very small, very little, and we ask them their, their feedback. In terms of NPS, I show you what it is, net performance, uh, net promoter score, but also open fields, open text where they can say, uh, I was uh, greeted uh, very kindly, or I didn't find the way, or the food is not good or whatever. They could write this. And so we have about two to 3,000 uh, returns every day. So it's very difficult to read all that. So we adopted some machine learning uh, to um, find uh, keywords in the in the free text and make some trends. Uh, and you can see, you will see the results. Uh, and this will it will this will give you um, a very good idea of what is actually going on. Another way that we use is this is a Dutch word. It's from the Flemish government. It's a it's a patient measurement a Flemish patient measurement system. And this is not so good, I think, because it's only uh, four times two weeks. So in every quarter, there is two weeks that every hospitalized patient can uh, fill in a questionnaire. OK, it's now digital. It's not, not writing anymore. Uh, and um, give some feedback uh, on, on their stay in the hospital. So it's more like a cohort um, limited in time measurement, but it's done in every Flemish hospital, so you can compare. That is the big advantage of this system. Uh, and here you see the, the net promoter score. Um, for those who don't know it, so the patient has to give a score between 0 and 10. 
um, those who are who fill in a number between uh, zero and six, they are called critics. Though those who fill in nine or ten are called promoters. Uh, seven or eight we don't consider because that is the average. And uh, you make uh, the net promoter score is actually the percentage of promoters minus the percentage of critical people defined like this. And if you have a promoter score between zero and 50, you are actually good. Uh, if you are uh, below zero, you need to do something. This is validated. Uh, this is a system that has been validated on millions of, of measurements. And so we do this for the hospital as a whole, but also for every department separately. And we feedback these data to our departments and we rank them. And we don't fill in everybody, but their location in the ranking of 42 departments is given to them. And we can say, OK, you are the, the third best. Uh, you have the third best score of the hospital. Congratulations. Or you are the worst of the hospital. Please do something eh? if your colleagues are scoring much better. And this is an, an incredible incentive that nobody wants to be uh, on the top. So you, this is very standardized. Here you see it in Dutch. Uh, sorry about the consultations. We have uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of, of responses. We have open text. So, so this. Um, uh, just to give you some some ideas of the um, the platform, um, and uh, here you see, for instance, some uh, categories, and you you can see uh, the trends where pe people are talking about. For instance, friendliness of the personnel at the highest score, and uh, there we were very happy. Eh? The friendliness, assistance, expertise. I said that is what we want. It's experience. And um, this comes before, for instance, the quality of the, the perceived quality of the doctors between brackets. So, uh, which of course is also measured, but that has nothing to do with patient experience. But we also measure the outcome of uh, the medical treatments. This Flemish uh, questionnaire where you can benchmark, you can benchmark with other hospitals or you can benchmark with yourself, your evolution in time. Uh, for instance, here's the percentage of ambassadors, eh? patients that, that give a nine or ten uh, as a score. And you see we are uh, always uh, around the, uh, the median or better. So this is OK for us. And we and, and this is uh, the, the question, for instance, how much would you um, uh, consider this hospital to be visited by your friends and families. Eh? You promote the hospital, recommend the hospital. And so you have about 50 of those questions where you can compare yourself with the other hospitals. And to finalize and to show you that it's not only the hospital in general, but also department specific. For instance, we have a, a very large uh, IVF department, uh, fertility department, uh, the biggest single center department in Europe. Uh, and so they have and they have a very specific population, of course, per definition it is very specific. It is women and couples between 20 and 45 years old. That is that is their population. So they have made their own validated survey in terms of uh, patient uh, experience and in terms of the results of all these steps in their pathway, they can improve uh, some things where the, the focus groups uh, come up with ideas. And, and another example is, for instance, something completely else is radiotherapy. They are very much focused on uh, outcome, quality, and also, to my big pleasure, patient satisfaction in terms of satisfaction in general, pain, toxicity, and uh, individualized uh, questions. I won't go in, and, and of course, the official because they have to be, of course, very, very um, detailed in the way they work. They have a, a number of uh, external extra uh, accreditations. But I show you this. These are co two completely different departments of the hospital, and they have made their own specific department specific disease specific KPIs. And luckily for us, but we ask it, of course, to them is to include always a patient experience chapter in this evaluation. This will go too much in detail, but 
uh, they have working points. And so they discern things that go good and things that can improve, and then they have an objective basis uh, to work upon. Um, and then finally, to measure things is okay, but you have to do something uh, with that information. So as I told you, uh, these Flemish government uh, questionnaires, they, they are public. They are on a public website. They are on our, on our own website. Our balance scorecard in terms of KPIs of the hospital is um, every quarter goes to the boardroom. Uh, every uh, So we have a central quality cell where we look at the hospital wide dashboard in ClickSense, that is uh, uh, the platform. And then we have decentral departmental measurements where they can make their own dashboards based on the things we measure everywhere, plus their department specific um, KPIs. And here is some example of a ClickSense dashboard that we present to the board to show them, OK, uh, we are doing fine or we had to have some problems or whatever. And um, this is also good if you want to allocate budgets to specific projects. It's not because of my gut feeling, but it's very often because of things going on that we see in our uh, dashboard. If, for instance, um, what we have seen, despite the music in the waiting rooms, there is still, for instance, in the emergency department, where people have to wait sometimes quite a lot after their um, screening, when they when they uh, come into the department, they can have five different colors, going from red to, to blue, and the, the blue ones uh, they sometimes, they sometimes have to wait for four hours. And so we have tried a lot of things, but one of the best things is to give immediate visible feedback. Uh, if you are triaged uh, code yellow, for instance, then it is uh, uh, two hours and 15 minutes waiting time. So you can have a coffee or whatever. You can go back out or whatever and come back in and you keep that space. So that's a huge success. Just the fact that patients know how long they have to wait and what they can do in between. So they will not harass the personnel from when it's my term and this patient came in after me, but is seen uh, before me. And that has to do with the triage color, of course. And so it's, it's very good. And now we are using this in every waiting room um, in the hospital. Uh, and so if a patient enters, which is completely digital, now you have seen with the lounge of the hotel, it comes in the waiting room. He's, he gets a little scan on his iPhone, he scans. So the doctor and the nurse in the department know when the patient arrives in the waiting room and then they, they see they have uh, still five minutes to finish the previous patient. Then this patient who enters the hospital, enters the waiting room, sees a personal message that uh, he will be seen in five minutes or in 10 minutes or whatever. So it's this immediate um, feedback loop uh, is tremendously uh, successful and increases um, the, the patient experience um, tremendously. So with this, I would like to uh, end my, my presentation. Uh, and of course, I am open uh, for uh, uh, questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent talk and for sharing uh, that much uh, and that many experiences. Uh, it's been very interesting. Uh, well, now it's turn uh, to share the floor with the audience and see if anyone wants to ask a question or or make a comment. Mm -hmm. I see there's a hand rise to so, uh, Joan Comboris. OK, yeah, thank you, Dr. Nopen, for a nice presentation. I, I take uh, three messages. Uh, one is the importance of the strategic plan. Uh, the, the second one is to, to consider the experience of facilities not related directly to, to uh, health care, like hotels or other areas. And the third one is that we talk with patient experience that we know we need to talk about professional experience. For me, are important message. Uh, to, in your experience, uh, what are the main barriers from the professional's perspective to change the mind related to the patient experience? Uh, that's a very good question, and that is one of the most difficult uh, elements in um, having uh, especially the doctors convinced of the importance because they are very focused on their own expertise and métier and, and specialty. And um, it is, for instance, easier to consider the nursing staff 
in this approach because they are much more sensitive to these, uh, let's say, these soft values of patient experience. Uh, so the most difficult to convince are the doctors, but that showed you a little trick is to make the results public. Semi-anonymous, but the, every department knows perfectly well not only uh, his or her clinical outcome data, but also data on patient experience. And you can you can find trends eh, in these texts of patients. You can find almost on a very granular level, individual level, where there are problems in the department. And this can be a help for the department head to show, look, this doctor, for instance, that you have to talk to him or her, there is a problem in, for instance, communication skills with patients. Give you some example. So this is the main hurdle uh, of um, getting everybody on board. But once, I can tell now from experience, once they have tasted the, um, let's say, the, the competition in a positive sense, from, okay, this is measured. So uh, every, if you, previously, a few years ago, when we, we see every department had uh, two times per year, and if we ask them, so are you patient satisfied, etc. Of course, eh, all their patients were very happy. But now we measure and we can rank. And so it is less um, just a gut feeling or, uh, you know, a wet finger. Um, and this, uh, of course, most doctors are also evidence based uh, people. So this helps to convince them to have uh, more attention to these little little things between brackets, which actually are not so little. Thank you. OK, I don't know if anybody else uh, has a question. If anyone has a problem with uh, with English or feels shy, we can try to translate as well. I, I can send you the presentation if you want, in, uh, and you can share it with uh, with everybody. Okay, that 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 would be great. We we would appreciate that. Um, well, if anyone has a question, I might add one myself. And well, you said that um, it's important to have the the umbrella of uh, of the hospital management to to develop this uh, th this strategy, right? But uh, I don't know how if if there is not this uh, this umbrella, this support, how can one further engage uh, hospital management uh, to develop these kind of strategies? And uh, linking with that, uh, should we or uh, study how these uh, patient experience indicators lean to other indicators like health outcomes? or resources or simply to link them to be clinical proxies uh, for for yeah. excellence for prestige for for clinicians yeah or, I, or should yeah. be worth it by themselves to measure yeah uh, yeah to to start with your the, the final part of your question that is i think if you look at uh, quality of care it is a very comprehensive definition and there is of course the clinical outcome, which is a basic metric that uh, goes without saying, but there are other aspects which are uh, included in the concept of quality of care. That is timeliness of care, that is the experience of care, etc. So for me, it makes just uh, it's just part of quality. And uh, if you only focus on, let's say, uh, five years survival after breast cancer, I don't know. Uh, well, that is, that is the minimum that you should have is a good five year survival. But that is quality of care is more than that, in my opinion. It is the, the, the more holistic approach to the, to the experience that the, the patient has. And I'm not, um, I'm also, uh, let's say, realistic enough that at least in Belgium, there is still quite a, a semi-competitive um, atmosphere between hospitals, eh? the battle for the patient between brackets. So uh, this, of course, helps. Eh? If the patient is very satisfied, he, he talks spontaneously about the hospital and is the best ambassador. So that is also a plus point. 
And now the, the first part of your question, if your board is not convinced that uh, this should be done, um, then I think it's the job of the CEO to go uh, to the board and knock on the table and <laughs> says this is important uh, for the hospital. It should be done. And the best way to convince the board then, I think, would be to, to come with, a, for instance, a pilot study and uh, start uh, NPS in a, in a single department or in two departments, for instance, and say, look, we have now measurements. This gives an idea of what we are doing, la la la. And then you can make your case. Uh, but again, it's not very expensive eh, to do all this. So it cannot be a question of budgets, but to do this or not do this, I think. OK, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your answer and uh, for your presentation. I don't know if uh, anyone wants to share a question. This would be the last chance. Uh, but then we'll call it a day. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you again, Dr. Nober, for, for your talk, for sharing your time and your knowledge. Uh, it's been very interesting. And thank you for all the audience to, to attending this online session. As we said at the beginning, this uh, has been recorded and will be uploaded uh, at the YouTube channel. Dr. Nopper said that uh, he's willing to share this presentation. I think it's very valuable. Thank you again. And for us, uh, this is it. I hope you enjoyed it and see you on our next session. Thank you. Thank you Thank all you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
Okay, you, correct, no, 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 no